There is a very popular misconception in the minds of many modern Americans regarding the nature of the U.S. federal government. The framers of the United States Constitution used the word democracy to refer to direct or bottom-up democracy, while they used the term republic to refer to representative or top-down democracy. Therefore, many people confuse the Democratic Party with advocating direct democracy, while confusing the Republican Party with advocating representative democracy. In effect, either way, the majority of modern American minds agree the two-party system is as natural an outgrowth of our democratic republic as was the Roman Republic from Greek democracy. But this is wrong. The two-party system that has developed over the past century in the United States is neither a direct nor representative democracy as envisioned by the framers of the Democratic Republic Constitution. Rather than either direct or representative democracy, we have become a mere imitation of the Roman Republic. Popular misconception admits this identification only in so far as it serves the ends of fascist-controlled, military-enforced, tyrannical dictatorship. It claims that we are in the equivalent of the late stages of the Roman Republic even now, rapidly approaching millenarian and eschatological empire. If it had not squelched the democracy of our founding fathers, it would be portraying our current government as equivalent to the Delian League of Ancient Greece, and thus accomplish the same pessimism in the modern mind that our political ideals inevitably degenerate into indifference to our slavery. I have composed some posts from research on Wikipedia regarding the actual nature of Greek democracy and the Roman Republic. Please bear with me as I introduce this brief history lecture before drawing a moral conclusion. In 683 BC, Populus Tyranoi had overthrown the Basileus in Athens. In 594 BC, the first tyrant, Pesistratus of Athens, 607 to 528 BC, appointed his lover, the poet Solon, the Archon over Attica, to subdue civil disorder in Syria over Salamis Island. Solon instituted the Siestiatia ordinances, repealing most of the laws of Draco, and instituting a Timocratia, where four classes of property owners, the larger farm owners, Hippias, or knights that owned their own smaller farms, tillers, or those who owned cattle and worked on the upper classes' farms, and the lowest class, the Thetes, or manual laborers, paid in a rate of six to three to one to zero taxes to Solon in return for their protection by Pisistratus. Following the success of Solon's reforms in subduing the civil disorder rampant in Attica, Pisistratus adopted the Solonian constitution, introducing trial by a jury of class peers compulsory military service determined according to class, a bull, council of 400 hereditary nobles or later official representatives chosen by lot from among the constituent citizens, the Areopagus, a senate of former archon eponymus, chief magistrate, polemarch, head of the armed forces, and archon Basilius, religious events coordinator that served as a murder tribunal, and introducing many new laws governing debt and taxation. The tyrants of the Pisistratus family ruled until 500 BC, when the Isonomia of Cleisthenes reformed the 400-member bull under Solon into the 500-member bull over the Ten Deems. In the Ten Deems, official representatives were chosen by lot, 
and in the Bull they proposed bills to the Dicasteria courts comprised of 201 to 5,001 jurors per day, up to 500 from each of the ten deems, who then voted by casting a white stone or a black stone on whether to reject, pass, or amend these bills. Once he had reorganized the bull from 400 under Solon to 500, in 508 B.C., Cleisthenes introduced the first bill, legislating ostracism or exile for ten years, any citizen judged by vote as having ambitions to overthrow the democracy and set themselves up as a tyrant, passed in 487 B.C. Race publica usually refers to a thing that is not considered to be private property, but which is rather held in common by many people. Taking everything together that is of public interest leads to the connotation that the race publica in general equals the state. The city of Rome itself stands on the banks of the river Tiber very near the west coast of Italy. It marked the border between the regions of Latium, the territory in which the Latin language and culture was dominant, to the south, and Etruria, the territory in which the Etruscan language and culture was dominant, to the north. According to Roman mythology, after the end of the Trojan War, the Trojan prince Aeneas sailed across the Mediterranean Sea to Italy and founded the city of Lavinium. His son, Julius, later founded the city of Alba Longa and, from Alba Longa's royal family, came the twins Romulus and Remus, supposedly sons of the god Mars by Rhea Silvia, who went on to found the city of Rome on April 21st, 753 B.C. Thus, the Romans traced their origins back to the Hellenic world. The Roman Republic would expand outwards from this single city-state. In the beginning, Rome had kings. The tradition portrays these kings more as cultural heroes than as historical figures each of them being credited with devising some aspect of Roman culture. For example, Numa Pompilius devised Roman religion and Ancus Martius, the arts of war. There is, however, general agreement that Rome did have a series of monarchs, some of whom were of Etruscan origin, the influence of the Etruscans can still be seen on early Roman art and architecture, and that these kings were displaced by the Roman aristocracy sometime around 500 to 450 B.C. Livy's version of the establishment of the Republic states that the last of the kings of Rome, Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, Tarquin the Proud, had a thoroughly unpleasant son, Sextus Tarquinius, who raped a Roman noblewoman named Lucretia. Lucretia compelled her family to take action by gathering her kinsmen, telling them what happened, and then killing herself. They were compelled to avenge her, and led an uprising that expelled the royal house, the Tarquins, out of Rome into refuge in Etruria. Lucretia's widowed husband, Lucius Tarquinius Collatinus, and her brother Lucius Junius Brutus were elected as the first two consuls of the new republic. Marcus Junius Brutus, who later assassinated Gaius Julius Caesar, claimed descent from this first Brutus. The traditional date of the revolution against the kings is 509 BC. The early consuls took over the roles of the king, with the exception of his high priesthood in the worship of Jupiter Optimus Maximus at the sacred temple on the Capitoline Hill. 
For that duty, the Romans elected a rex sacrorum, a king of holy things. It is interesting to note that the Roman rex sacrorum was forbidden membership in the Senate. One could not be a senator and a rex sacrorum at the same time. Republican Rome distanced to even this vestigial king from any possibility of power. Until the end of the Roman Republic, the accusation that a powerful man wanted to make himself rex, king, remained a career-shaking charge. Julius Caesar's assassins claimed that they were preserving Rome from the re-establishment of a monarchy. To replace the leadership of the kings, a new office was created with the title of consul. Initially, the consuls possessed all of the king's powers in the form of two men, elected for a one-year term, who could veto each other's actions. Later, the consuls' powers were broken down further by adding other magistrates that each held a small portion of the king's original powers. First among these was the praetor, which removed the consul's judicial authority from them. Next came the censor, which stripped from the consuls the power to conduct the census. The Romans instituted the dictatorship. The dictator was given complete authority over all of Rome's civil and military matters, and there was no appeal from his decisions. His power was so absolute that the Romans only dared to appoint a dictator in times of severe emergencies, and the sole thing that kept this dictator from becoming another king of Rome was his six-month term limit. The king's religious powers were given to two new offices, the Rex Sacrorum and the Pontifex Maximus. The Rex Sacrorum was the de jure highest religious official for the Republic. His sole task was to make the annual sacrifice to Jupiter, a privilege that had been previously reserved for the king. The Pontifex Maximus, however, was the de facto highest religious official who held most of the king's religious authority. He had the power to appoint all Vestal Virgins, Flamens, Pontiffs, and even the Rex Sacrorum himself. By the beginning of the first century BC, the Rex Sacrorum was all but forgotten, and the Pontifex Maximus given almost complete authority over the Roman religion. The conflict of the orders was a political struggle between the impoverished plebeians, plebes, and wealthy patricians, patricii, of the ancient Roman Republic, in which the plebeians sought political equality and achieved it in 287 BC, after two centuries of strife. The relationship between the plebeians and the patricians sometimes came under such strain that the plebeians would secede from the city, taking their families and movable possessions, and setting up camp on a hill outside the walls. Their refusal to cooperate any longer with the patricians led to social changes. Only about fifteen years after the establishment of the Republic, in 494 BC, Plebeians seceded and chose two leaders to whom they gave the title tribunes. The plebeians took an oath that they would hold their leaders sacrosanct, untouchable, during their terms of office, and that a united plebiscite would kill anyone who harmed a tribune. The second secession, in 471 BC, led to further legal definition of their rights and duties and increased the number of tribunes to ten. The final secession ended in 287 BC, and the resulting Lex Hortensia gave the vote of the Concilium Plebis, or Council of the Plebeians, the force of law. It is important to note that this force of law was binding for both social classes. The Roman assemblies were the Comitia Calata, the Comitia Curiata, the Comitia Centuriata, and 
the Comitia Tributi, and possessed ultimate legislative and judicial powers in the Roman Republic, and were also responsible for the election of magistrates. The Roman assemblies possessed ultimate legislative powers, including the ability to pass ex post facto laws and bills of attainder. They were also not deliberative assemblies. Normal citizens neither debated nor proposed legislation. Only magistrates could propose legislation. The assemblies also possessed judicial powers, some of which were transferred to permanent courts later in the Republic. In the later Republic, a subset of the Comitia Tributa, the Concilium Plebis, gained the legislative powers of the assemblies and became the favored legislative mechanism. The honored expression, Senatus Populusque Romanus, abbreviated as SPQR, often used as an indication for the Roman state, clearly testifies to the general perception that Rome was legitimately ruled by the will of the people in the assemblies, guided by the Senate, and under their authority by the magistrates. Only when the Principiate was established within the Republic, which was never abolished, did a single person, the Roman Emperor, start to embody the state politically and hence incarnate the Majestus of Rome. The Comitia Collata was held under the presidency of the Pontifex Maximus. The meeting probably took place in the Capitoline Hill in front of the Curia Calabria. The Comitia Collata and the Comitia Curiata were the only assemblies recognized before the time of Servius Tullius. The assembly consisted entirely of patricians, organized into curiae and performed the following functions. Announcements of the pontiffs concerning timekeeping and nature of certain dates. Inauguration of Flamines and the Rex Sacrorum. And witnessing testaments of patricians in order to avoid any disputes following the death of the person in question. The Comitia Curiata, Curiate Assembly was the oldest Roman assembly after the Comitia Collata. It consisted entirely of patricians, organized in thirty curiae, which were voting units that each cast one collective vote. This assembly originally was the only assembly which transacted business, electing all magistrates, granting their imperium, and enacting laws. The Comitia Centuriata, the Centuriat Assembly, included both patricians and plebeians, organized into five economic classes, knights and senators being the first class, and distributed among internal divisions called Centuriae. Membership in the Centuriate Assembly required certain economic status, and power was heavily vested in the first and second classes. The Centuriate Assembly met annually to elect the next year's consuls and praetors, and quincennially, every five years, to elect the censors. It also sat to try cases of high treason, per diulio, although the latter function fell into disuse after Lucius Apelius Saturninus introduced a more workable format, Magistas. A citizen's vote did not count in the Centuriate Assembly. Rather, the individual's vote was counted within his century and determined the outcome of the century's vote. Because only the first 18, and richest, centuries were kept to the normal size of 100 members, members of those centuries exerted a disproportionate influence over the outcome of votes. The Centuriate Assembly, originally a military assembly of knights, had to meet outside the Pomerium of Rome 
on the campus Martius, since no army was permitted inside the pomerium. The Comitia Tributa, tribal assembly, included both patricians and plebeians, distributed among the thirty-five tribes into which all Roman citizens were placed for administrative and electoral purposes. The vast majority of the urban population of Rome was distributed among the four urban tribes, which meant that their votes were individually insignificant. Like the Centuriate Assembly, voting was indirect, with one vote apportioned to each tribe. A subset of the Tribal Assembly, called the Plebeian Council, legislated for the plebeians and lower classes, and elected the plebeian tribunes and aediles. Their plebiscites only had the force of law for the entire republic after 287 BC. The traditional story, whose primary source is the first few books of Levi, is that the patricians were the aristocrats of Rome, taking over when the kings were expelled and the republic formed in 509 BC while the plebeians were the lower class. Initially, only patricians could hold magistracies, such as the consulate, positions in the religious colleges, and sit in the Roman Senate. However, the patrician clans abused their position, using the creditor's right of nexum to take plebeian debtors into bondage and selling them as slaves favoring patricians over plebeians in court cases and overriding the will of the centuriate assembly. Plebeian responses included the establishment of the tribunes, whose authority to protect plebeians was eventually accepted by the patricians, and the Council of Plebes, Concilium Plebis, whose decisions were originally binding only on plebeians, but in 287 applied to all citizens as well. The plebes convinced the patricians by engaging in secessio, the act of leaving the city and refusing to participate until the patricians gave in. In 449 BC, the Decemvirs codified the law via the Twelve Tables, but then their Eleventh Table forbade intermarriage between patricians and plebeians, sharpening the distinction between the classes and it was soon repealed by the Lex Canulia of 445 BC. According to traditional, semi-legendary historical accounts preserved in Livy, during the earliest period of the Republic, the laws were kept secret by the pontifices and other representatives of the patrician class, and were enforced with untoward severity especially against the plebeian class. A plebeian named Tarentilius proposed in 462 BC that an official legal code should be published so that plebeians could not be surprised and would know the law. For several years, the patricians opposed this request, but in 451 BC, a decemvirate, or board of ten men, was appointed to draw up a code. They allegedly sent an embassy to study the legislative system of the Greeks, particularly the laws of Solon, possibly in the Greek colonies of southern Italy. The laws of the Twelve Tables were not a comprehensive statement of all law. They are a sequence of definitions of various private rights and procedures, similar to a Bill of Rights. For such an important document, it is somewhat surprising that the original text has been lost. Like most other primitive laws, they combine strict and rigorous penalties with equally strict and rigorous procedural forms. The final crisis in the struggle came in 287 BC, when economically stressed farmers demanded debt relief from the Senate and were rebuffed. A secessio resulted in the Senate appointing the plebeian Quintus Hortensius, the elder, as dictator, who solved the problem in a manner unknown to us, then passed the Lex Hortensia 
giving equal weight to the decrees of the Senate and the Council of Plebes. Although individuals identified themselves as plebeian or patrician for the remainder of the Republic and well into the Empire, and the patricians retained certain priesthoods, there was no political difference between the orders. During the early and middle Republic, the Senate, highest in prestige and being composed of the aristocratic, rich, and politically influential, containing many ex-magistrates, was predominant in the Roman state. During the latter years of the Republic, a division developed within the Senate with two factions arising, the Optimates and the Populares. The Optimates held to the traditional forms of Roman government, while the Populares were those who used the fact that the plebeian assembly was capable of passing binding laws, plebiscites, on the Republic to pursue political influence outside the Senate. Since the Senate controlled the finances of the state, this would lead to conflicts between the Senate and the plebeian assembly. Many ambitious politicians would use these conflicts to further their political career, advancing themselves as champions either of Roman tradition or of the people. Optimates, good men, were the aristocratic faction of the later Roman Republic. They wished to limit the power of the popular assemblies and the tribunes of the plebes, and to extend the power to the Senate, which was viewed as more stable and more dedicated to the well-being of Rome. In particular, they were concerned with the rise of individual generals who, using the tribunate, the assemblies, and the brute force of their own soldiers, could overpower the Senate itself. The optimates favored the nobiles, noble families, and opposed the ascension of novi homines, new men, usually provincials whose family had no former political experience, into Roman politics. Populares, favoring the people, singular popularis, were aristocratic leaders in the late Roman Republic who tended to use the people's assemblies in an effort to break the stranglehold of the nobiles and optimates on political power. Populari plans included some moving of Roman citizens to provincial colonies, expansion of citizenship to communities outside of Rome and Italy, and modification of the grain dole and monetary value. The Populari cause reached its peak under the dictatorship of Julius Caesar, the most avid leader of the Populares. After the creation of the Second Triumvirate, 43 BC to 33 BC, the cause of the Populares was essentially destroyed. So we see that there are both distinct differences and distinct similarities between Greek Golden Age democracy and the Roman Republic era. The Roman Republic lasted from 509, overthrow of the kings, to 44, installation of Caesar as emperor, BC, or 465 orbits around the sun in total. Greek democracy lasted only from 594, installation of Solon as Archon of Attica, to 477, initiation of the Delian League under Athens, B.C., or 117 orbits around the sun in total. Athenian democracy utilized round numbers, the bull of 500 over the 10 deems, at first, but later switched to odd numbers, the 201 to 501 jurors. The Roman Republic utilized even numbers, the original 30 farmers and 100 knights of the assemblies, from 494 BC on, but stopped using odd numbers, the 35 tribes, 
in 287 BC with the initiation of the Plebeian Council. From study of the Roman Republic in his discourses, Niccolo Machiavelli wrote the first treatise of the modern era on the natural state of man, describing them as essentially like animals. It would not be for several hundred more years that John Locke would be able to study the rarer historical descriptions at the time of Athenian Greek democracy, and he would describe the natural state of man as one of inherent freedom to act of their own accord. From Machiavelli, the framers such as James Madison adopted their stance on representative democracy, and from Locke, Framers such as Thomas Jefferson adopted their stance on direct democracy. However, by the time of the framers, only direct or representative forms of democracy were considered just and noble in themselves, serving the ends of the greatest number of people at once. The Machiavellian hardline on republicanism being the only way to topple principalities, aristocratic dictatorships, which had resurfaced during the French Revolution, had been, by the time of the American Revolutionary War, dampened in definition to accord with Locke's social compact and idealistic human nature based more on Greek democracy. America was never intended to be a representative republic. It was framed in its constitution as a representative democracy but it has degenerated into a federal republic where special interest groups such as the military-industrial complex, big businesses, and the intelligence community constitute a fascist oligarchy hidden within our political system of government. These special interest groups fund both political parties, nominees, campaigns for every office from the commander-in-chief right down to my local commissioner of education. These special interest groups comprise the de facto shadow government of the United States now. In ancient times, according to Aristotle, there were three types of government, monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy, that would each inevitably degenerate into a corrupt form of itself, tyranny, oligarchy, and what Machiavelli later labeled licentiousness, meaning graft and bribery. Monarchy being the first was considered the most natural, but most undesirable, to the ancient mind, followed by aristocracy, or control by landowning vassals, and finally democracy the most ideal and desirable of all. According to modern misinterpretation, American representative democracy has followed the same exact course as Athenian direct democracy becoming the Roman representative republic. However, as we have now seen, this is not the case. According to actual history, the Roman Republic always bore a fundamental difference to its Athenian democratic predecessor. By having only even numbers of delegates representing the Roman citizens, the Romans were able to maintain their republic for much longer than the Greeks maintained direct democracy through using odd numbers of delegates. This is because the Athenian democracy began as an attempt to thwart crime, to quell an uprising in Attica, within an existing tyranny, hence a third party legislating over a dispute between two, while the Roman Republic began as a civic experiment replacing monarchical monopoly with duly held executive official positions a la Romulus and Remus, while resolution is built into democracy, perpetual conflict is built into a republic. The goal of creating a peace, as opposed to the goal of sustaining and lengthening or maintaining and enforcing an existing peace, was the root difference at the origin of democracy and the republic, respectively. Once peace was achieved, democracy, like Marx's dictatorship of the proletariat, or the original concept of the tyrant, 
was designed to wither away. However, for a republic to function prosperously, there must be perpetual competition with no conflict resolution that does not arm both sides and thus perpetuate the conflict. What do I mean when I talk of the importance of the even and the odd forms of government? What can such a minute and inconsequential sum as the single individual do to offset the whole course of world events, to shape history? What can one man do? In a republic they can do nothing, in either a direct, by popular vote, or by representative, so elected officials, democracy, one person can be the linchpin of the entire apparatus. Consider these primary differences between the Greek democracy and the Roman Republic. One was founded to bring peace, one to maintain it. One was odd, one was even. Apply these to the modern American political system, where the two-party system is used as a fulcrum for leverage by corporate private interests against the popular government by the American people, envisaged for us by our founding fathers. On January 10th, 49 B.C., Gaius Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon and began the civil war that would transform the corrupt Roman Republic into the morally bankrupt Roman Empire. Of course, at that time, it would be impossible for even such a great tactician as Julius Caesar, the most renowned proconsul, to predict. Pompey and the other senators argued that Caesar should relinquish his office as his term was up and he could not be renominated while in absentia in Gaul. That is why, when Caesar crossed the Rubicon on January 10th, 49 B.C., he said, Alia octa est, meaning the die is cast. However, how do we date this event? We are using a calendar in the Western business world, i.e. modern Western civilization, called the Gregorian calendar. The Gregorian calendar was reformed in the 16th century by a pope of the Holy Roman Catholic Church. However, before this, the form of calendar in use throughout the early Renaissance and the Dark Ages was the Julian calendar. It was invented by Julius Caesar. Following the Roman Civil War and the death of Senator Pompey at the hands of a Roman attendant to Ptolemy, the rival of Cleopatra, and following Julius Caesar's return from conquering Ptolemy's enemies in Egypt and his own in Greece, with Cleopatra as his de facto bride, yet only four short years after Caesar crossed the Rubicon, the Julian calendar was implemented. Within a year, Caesar was dead, assassinated by his own friend Brutus and sixty liberatory senators and conspirators. Two years after his murder, Caesar would be named the Divine Julius, Divus Julius, and his heir, his son with Cleopatra, Gaius Octavian Augustus Caesar, would be declared son of a god, Divi Filius. Of course, in his own life, Caesar himself rejected even the title of Rex, king, replying, Rempublicum sum, I am the Republic. Although he accepted such titles as Pater Patriae, Father of the Fatherland, and Prefect of Morals, Prefectus Morum, when his chief general and secondary heir, Mark Antony, attempted to put a diadem on his head one month to the day before his assassination. Caesar refused and said, I will not be king of Rome. Jupiter alone is king of the Romans. Although it is because of Caesar's assassination on the unlucky Ides of March of 44 BC, even the date of this year has been adjusted to fit the Christian calendar used by Pope Gregory. Obviously, 44 B.C. 
with the exception of some Pythagoreans, was not called such at the time. Instead, 44 BC was year two of the Julian calendar. The year zero of the Julian calendar was the Gregorian year 46 BC. Just as the birth of Christ is commonly reckoned by modern historians of that era to have occurred in 4 BC, the year of Herod's death, according to Josephus, the entire Julian calendar was backdated for its point of origin to the founding of Rome, Anno Urbis Conditae. Before the Julian reforms to the Roman calendar, the calendar of Rome is thought to have derived from a Greek lunar form. The discrepancy between the original Roman calendar and the reformed Julian calendar was, by the Gregorian year 46 BC, off by about 120 days. When Caesar implemented the Julian calendar in 46 BC, that year was counted as lasting an extra 120 days. The Roman calendar year before the year 46 BC Gregorian was 355 days long. The Julian year after the year 46 BC Gregorian was 365 days long. The year 46 BC Gregorian itself was 445 days long. To commemorate the year in which the Julian calendar was implemented, which would have been called then by Romans 708 AUC, Julius Caesar built a temple to Venus Genetrix, Mother Venus, and held a festival in her honor on September 26th. Of course, the date given as September 26th on the intercalary leap or zero year of the Julian calendar's implementation can obviously be reckoned different ways according to different calendars. The Julian calendar was 365 days long for three years and 366 days every fourth, but the 355 days of the prior Roman calendar were already divided into the 12 months and these were divided each by a calend, new year, ides, or knowns. The dates on which the ides and knowns, beginnings and ends of months, occurred alternated on either the 15th or the 13th and the 7th or the 5th of the month. In other words, the names of the months were the same but their beginning and end dates differed. In March, July, October, May, the Ides fall on the 15th day, the Knowns, the 7th, and all besides, have two days less for Knowns and Ides. Nonetheless, the Ides, the 15th of March, 44 B.C. Gregorian, 710 AUC Julian was measured by the year of 365.25 days implemented two years prior by Julius Caesar himself. However, secretly, among the conspirators, the Ides would have meant something very different. On 46 BC Gregorian, 708 AUC Julian, the last year of confusion, the year of 445 days. Dates after the Ides of the month counted down towards the start of the next month, so the extra days had the effect of raising the initial value of the count for the day after the Ides. Thus, the Ides, the beginning date of the month, usually reckoned as the eighth day following the knowns, which mark the end of the last month. Between the knowns and ides on the Julian leap year, the days counted up, one, two, three, etc. But between the ides and knowns, the days counted down, three, two, 
one, etc. Therefore, when the liberatories thought of the Ides, they thought of the number of days remaining between the Ides and the next knowns as being increased from eight to eighteen by adding ten extra days every month to correct the calendar. Therefore, by killing Caesar on the Ides of March, the liberatories were reacting to Caesar's seeming assumption of godlike status. It was Jupiter, or rather Zeus, who, in the originally Greek mythology, slew Cronus, the titan god of time, by correcting the calendar. Consider that, for example, in 45 BC, the first 365-day year of the restored Julian calendar, essentially the Pythagorean year 1, and, in fact, only 363 days prior to his assassination, on March 17th, 709 AUC, Caesar was named Dictator Perpetuus, Dictator for Life. This single event began the Roman Empire. So, to commemorate that event the following year, however, on the Ides, to underscore the sore spot of the increase of ten days following the Ides of the two-year past leap year of Julian calendar reform, Caesar was betrayed and assassinated by young Servilius Casca, who played the strange part of trying to forewarn Caesar's colleague, Mark Antony, the night before, as well as being the one to actually slit Caesar's throat. It is not surprising that, when failing to kill Caesar with one blow, Casca cried out to his fellow conspirators in Greek, 